it easy. How about at the end of the day, you do anything, you're not really fascinated by rituals. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really important to be ethical and to be paying them well above. Hi, I'm Owen from Rest Australia. Thanks for tuning into the Rest Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, what we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, Please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Good evening, everyone. If you can hear me, please say g'day. Um, I am recording this from Sydney today. Uh, for those of you who may already know that, recording this from the hotel room in Sydney, uh, where I've just stopped back before heading out for dinner. And uh, I hope you can uh, hear me loud and clear. I can see uh, Paul's back again after being here last night for the, the live show. Uh, ben, can hear you. Thanks, mate. Appreciate that. I do apologize because I, um, I'm usually late, as you know, but uh, I'm a little bit annoyed with myself because I just bought this brand new microphone. I'll just grab it. And um, I managed to buy this brand new microphone for a while I'm on the road. And um, sure enough, with 60 seconds to go, I knocked the microphone off the stand and it broke. So that's $400 very well spent. Pretty annoyed at myself because I also needed that microphone because I'm heading to uh, to Indonesia tomorrow, heading over to Bali for about 10 days and um, hoping to use the microphone over there. So I'm going to try and figure that out for next week's uh, live show. But welcome to Rask Live in any case. Um, I hope you uh, have a wonderful evening here with me and thank you to everyone that did tune in last night for the Sydney uh, live stream of our of our Rask Row Show event, the final, number 10, the 10th event of all. So um, you might be all live streamed out by now, but um, thank you for those of you that are joining me, Sala, uh, Martin, Robert, g'day. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's good to see so many familiar faces. So tonight we're going to talk about a new segment for the Rask Live program. We've been trying this segment out on our Australian Investors podcast, and it's actually proven to be one of my favorite that we've ever done. And it's one that has received probably the most feedback, positive feedback that we've had for many years on any of the segments that we show across the Rask Network. And it's probably the one that I enjoy doing the most because we actually get to talk about real investments and we're responding to basically what you've told us to respond to. Um, so you send us in your companies, you send us in your ETFs, your managed funds, all of this type of stuff. And um, we can then pass judgment on it. And it's a, it's a good bit of fun. And Jenny, I can see you say, sorry, I just, just couldn't make it last night. So disappointed. We're sailing to Sydney on the high seas. Well, that sounds fun. That sounds like more fun than the event. Um, so don't worry, Jenny, you didn't miss out on that much. We will be back again next year, of course. So we'll be covering five different companies, ETFs, et cetera, in these segments. Hopefully I can do them once a month and hopefully next month we'll be joined by Mel Vincent, um, who has a history working in ETFs and funds management. You might know her, um, but she couldn't make it tonight. So it's just me. You're stuck with just me, but that's okay. Um, Raptor, you said Bali just came back from there. It is a nice place, isn't it? Indeed, mate. A good place to get away. It's probably cheaper than going to Queensland these days. So um, hopefully, hopefully that's true and uh, can have a good time and save some money. So let's bring up the screen right here. And as we go through tonight, I want you to keep in the back of your mind just any, um, I guess, companies that you want to add to the list because we'll chuck them on the list now uh, and we'll go through it. Let's start at the top, shall we? So every Wednesday, typically every Wednesday night at 6 p.m., we'll be going live. So if you haven't already subscribed, no matter where you're getting this, if you're on the Australian Shareholders Association, if you're on RASC, or if you're on the Self Wealth YouTube channel, be sure to hit subscribe. It's free and you get notifications when we do go live. Uh, I noticed that was the case uh, when we went live yesterday. I could 
it was weird. I could kind of see everyone on stage in front of me, but I also got the notification on my YouTube app to say, hey, Rask is live. And I could watch everyone on stage, even though I was in the audience. Um, so that was kind of cool, but also a bit creepy. So um, make our day by subscribing if you haven't already. Okay, so I didn't prepare tonight's dad joke. So I want to be very clear that I didn't prepare this one. Mel did. Um, and maybe this is, uh, maybe, I don't think it's a little dig at yours truly, but maybe because I am going a little bit bald. Uh, and the joke goes as follows. 90% of bald people still own a comb. They just can't part with it. And that comes from Dad Gives Jokes on Twitter. Uh, so 90% of bald people still own a comb. They just can't part with it, which kind of makes sense. I can't really part my hair these days, but that's the thing. Um, so that's joke out of 10. How did Mel do? I'll put Mel back in the spotlight for this one. How did she do? Okay, coming up on RAS Live over the next few months, we've got a heap of great speakers coming up. I've actually just confirmed a couple more. So watch this space. But tonight we've got Core Satellite Avoid. Um, your five ideas will be put to the test. And every one of the five ideas tonight has an emerging markets theme and principally an Asian theme. Uh, so there are some emerging markets that aren't in Asia, like some markets in, say, Latin America. Um, but these companies and these uh, ETFs and stocks that we're talking about tonight are all themed around Asia, including ANZ, which I will get to in a little bit. I'll just bring this down a little touch here. So, Jenny, you've given it a 10 out of 10. I'll pass that on to Mel. I think that's the highest I've ever got, and I didn't come with the joke. So hopefully that's a, a good sign of things to come when we do have Mel on the show. So um, coming up on the show, we've got a few stocks for retirement. We've got a property update with Chris, uh, and then we'll be doing more of an Ask Me Anything style thing. But we've got some fantastic speakers coming down the pike, so be sure to stay tuned uh, for what's to come. So this was just a, for those of you that couldn't make it last night, I thought I'd share just a little bit of a... Um, a screen grab of last night, some photos that I took. So uh, we had about 300 there last night, which was just absolutely amazing. Heard from so many great speakers from Magellan, uh, Glenn James, uh, Queenie, Tash, um, the property peeps like uh, Pete Wodge and so many others. So um, yeah, Women Talking Finance. Karen, it's so wonderful to have you in the chat tonight. Karen Ely, thank you. Women Talking Finance. I think that's you. Yes, I can see in the, the little image there. So fantastic. Thank you for joining us. And hopefully you'll come up one day and join us on the Rask Live show. So thank you indeed. Um, it was a, it was a great, great night. So Dave, you can find the replay for last night over on the Rask YouTube channel. It's there for you. Um, and speaking of another David, David, you've said, uh, for a core portfolio, Sol Pattinson, more than 100 years of increasing dividends. You know what's another one, David Roberts, that you've mentioned, Sol Pats, is uh, Brickworks. Brickworks, I heard a podcast this week uh, between Scott Phillips, who was our guest on this show last fortnight, and um, Lindsay uh, Partridge from Brickworks. And uh, there's only been one time that Brickworks has not increased its dividend in the past 50 years or so. And so both Brickworks and Sol Pattinson have a cross shareholding and uh, they've both worked wonders for each other. So one, I wanted to be really clear about something tonight. So tonight we'll be covering these five different businesses or ETFs and what have you. And um, all of these are a different thing. So we've got a managed fund here that you can buy through Self Wealth or your brokerage account. We've got BYD, which is an electric car company that I don't know a great deal about. And we've got uh, St uh, Starbucks, which many of you will know. We've got the Beta Shares Asia Technology Tigers ETF, and we've got ANZ. Now, they're all a bit different. And what we want to bring into the mix over the next few months is when you send in what you want us to research, and I'll get the analyst to go and have a look at it at RASC, and I'll say, hey, go and look at this and bring me back your report, and I'll present that to you. Um, what we want to do is we want to have... We don't just want to talk about ETFs. We don't just want to talk about stocks. We don't just want to talk about managed funds. We don't just want to talk about, you know, we want to talk about a bit of everything. So throw some unusual ideas in the mix and don't be afraid for us to take it anywhere. But the reason that this new segment exists on the live program is very simple. A lot of the times in finance and investing in particular, you'll see things like buy, hold and sell. So this will be buy, hold, sell. And these get the biggest audiences when it comes to investing. But I find it's very, very shallow. And I'll give you an example. Let's say um, Ron's just talking about uh, Sol Pattinson right now. So S-O-L is the ticker symbol. So um, Ron, you know what I'm talking about. So let's say we take um, Sol Pattinson right here. 
uh, which is a company that I really do like. I think it's a wonderful business. It's a holding company, in effect. Um, let's say we take this and you go, hey, Owen, give me a buy, hold, sell rating on Washington H. Sol Pattinson. And I come out and say, hey, yeah, it's a really good business. Let's buy it. Let's put a buy on that. And let's say it does pretty well. Now, you might be thinking, well, great. Owen said for some reason in a one-minute video back in the day that it was a buy. And that's great. And you might make money if it goes up. But what happens if it goes up and then you need to find the exit? You need to sell. You won't know exactly unless you put in your own research. And another one is like, what happens if you already have a lot of Australian shares in your portfolio? Would it be a good idea to add another Australian share? So what we're trying to do with the um, this core satellite avoid is basically take the philosophy which you know from RASC and which is the core and the satellite approach and then apply the different investments to where that might fit in the portfolio. I hope that makes sense. So we'll be able to determine whether it would be more appropriate for the core, whether it would be more appropriate for the satellite or whether we should just avoid it all together. And so let's get stuck in, shall we? Before we do, a bit of a refresher on core and satellite. So inside the core of a portfolio, in my opinion, this is where your portfolio should be diversified and low cost. So if we zoom right in, I'll bring the, the zoom right in here. Some things that I would definitely want in my core portfolio would include local and international shares. I might even go see if I can make this a bit bigger again. Local and international shares. I'd also want to make sure that I've got some bonds in there, otherwise known as fixed interest, and both from Australia and overseas, maybe some cash in here. I can explain that in a minute and some emerging markets. This last one here is optional. I would say it's a listed property. So you could invest in property funds like REITs and these types of things. You don't have to do that. And I just put that there as a kind of like a, a thing that you can see how it would illustrate. Obviously, the green in this chart is to try and show you what would be considered higher risk. And the blue is what would be typically considered lower risk. And in the core here, we have very simple long-term focused investments. But around the outside in these satellite components around here, you can have a bit of fun. I think that's fair to say. Investing should be fun um, because if you don't enjoy what you're doing, you probably never achieve the mastery that you want to achieve. So I would say for the most part, um, this part of a portfolio could be fun. So we'll try and identify things that could go in there. We might also put in some things that are a bit higher risk maybe a bit shorter term focus, so like three to five years. In my opinion, the core of a portfolio should only be seven years or more, maybe even 10 or 20 years, depending on how long of a time frame you've got. But this shouldn't be mucked around with. When you have a core portfolio, build it once and build it properly. Don't muck around with it. Don't come in with second guesses and you're not understanding why you're making an investment because this is where the serious money is made. And then around the outside, we have the individual investments. Now, I'm just going to hide my bookmarks so we get a bit more space on the page. There we go. That's a bit better. So around the outside, we have a bit more expression. And on the inside, we probably have things that are considered maybe a bit more boring. Let's start off with the Fidelity Emerging Markets Fund. Now, you can look this up inside your self-wealth or whatever brokerage account you use. So you can look it up and you can see that it's available in here. But what you will see is that it doesn't say ETF. So we've talked about this briefly in the past. But the reason that it doesn't say ETF in the title when you look it up is because it can't be called an ETF because it's an actively managed fund. So what that means is Fidelity's team go around looking for investments to make based on what they believe is high quality research. Now, this would be very different to something else we're going to talk about tonight, which is the Asia ETF. So I'll bring that up really quickly. So with the, uh, this is the one that I want. Sorry, I'm also trying out a new mouse while I'm on the road, and it's not really working out for me. So the BetaShares Asia Technology Tigers ETF is an ETF because it follows a set rule of what goes in the portfolio and when and how much. But the Femex fund or Fidelity Global Emerging Markets Fund is a managed fund. So typically in the past, you would have to go to the Fidelity website and you would have to either be a financial advisor or just click invest, right? On their website, you maybe fill in, um, you fill in uh, the, <laughs> I just read, uh, Karen, I just saw your 
uh, you know, I'm not having much fun with Femex, Owen. Um, well, I hope it can be fun. Investing should be fun, but maybe uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But um, at the end of the day, I think um, oh, no sound says Salah. So no, can you hear me? Just want to make sure you can everyone hear me? Please confirm. Salah, if you can't hear me, I hope that's okay. Um, if not, um, please let me know in the comments, guys, because it's a bit hard. I, don't, I can't hear myself, so I hope I'm not going crazy. Um, in any case, so yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. So it might be a, a problem with um, maybe headphones or something like that. Okay. Uh, so what we see with this fund is it provides exposure to um, an actively managed portfolio. So uh, Harry, you said Femex has been treating me better than IEM. I'll get to that in just a minute. And thanks, Chris. So the fund has been around for a long time. In fact, since 2013, but it was only put on the ASX in 2018. So if you look at the track record, which is the one that I've put down here, that's for the ETF strategy, when you should also be aware that it's also been a managed fund before that. So you could invest in it before that. You would just need a different way to do that. So the company, uh, sorry, the fund has been performing pretty well in that time. And so if we just jump back to the page and we scroll down, uh, where are we? Da -da -da. Here we go. So since 2018, uh, the fund has performed pretty good at 9.8% per annum when there's the benchmark is 5.43%. So meaning that it's done better than the index by about 4%. Now you might be asking, well, hey, Owen, don't you often say that ETFs and index funds typically do better than most active funds? And that is true. But what we find for the most part is that in emerging markets, so that's like places like China, India, these types of places, is that good fund managers can actually outperform. Now, not all of them, only depending on the studies that you look at, maybe about 60% um, chance of beating the benchmark over three or five years. So in a sense, what you end up with is, yes, you should have index funds and ETFs for a big part of your portfolio, but maybe there are certain places where you can invest where you should have a managed fund or an actively managed ETF. And those do exist. And I believe that emerging markets is one of those areas. Um, and I quite like this fund um, because it's one of the few that are available on the ASX. So most of the, the good fund managers you can't buy via the ASX or via your self wealth account. So um, I can't remember who it was. Um, uh, da, da, da. Harry, you mentioned IEM. So let's just take a really simple example here. And so if we look at IEM, IEM is basically, it's just an ETF that uses the same strategy that um, uses an index strategy, sorry, but uses, focuses on the same markets. So if we look at IEM, and I'll bring that up um, on the iShares website, the, da, 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 and I'll bring this up here. Once we're in, we'll be able to see this. So if we look over the past few years, so say we take, uh, this is to the end of September, uh, say we take the five-year look at it, we can see 1.68% for IEM. And if we go back, make sure we're looking in the same time period. So this is to the end of August, so it's not exactly the same, so keep that in mind. Uh, over three years, we've got 4.55. So let's maybe take the three years, 4.55. And if we go back to this, over three years, we've got 0 0.26. Now, you could argue and you could say, well, Owen, you're just comparing IEM to Femex. Um, and there is another one, the Vanguard, uh, available on the SX, Emerging Markets ETF. I think it's VEG, is it? VGE. I always get a bit confused. Um, so we'll just wait for this to load. But basically what you'll see, and I'll zoom out a bit, basically what you'll see is that for a, these types of like emerging markets slash Asian ETFs is you'll find that the active fund has, has performed best over that time. Now I'll just bring this up. Uh, da, 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 I don't like the chart. I like the table. Thank you, Vanguard. So over three years, we can see here the total return um, is around 3.73%, um, which for the most part is still decent, you know, better than IEM, but still not that good. Um, because I want you to remember the reason that you invest in emerging markets is you're looking for faster growth. Um, 
note to, to anyone watching this um, is that three year track records for me is really the absolute minimum track record. And remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. And that's really important because um, most people tend to uh, underperform. They tend to do worse than their fund manager if they focus on a one-year return. Like they just tend to chase the performance of last year. That doesn't really work. That's why you see all of the disclaimers say things like past performance is not indicative of future performance. Now, I, I agree with that statement, but also while history doesn't repeat itself, it may rhyme. And over the long term, we see that good investors tend to keep doing pretty well and um, bad investors tend to keep doing pretty bad if they don't learn. Um, so, Marco, you've said, do you think over time that some stocks are being artificially inflated because they are part of an ETF rather than performing well in their own right? Or are they already on the way up? And that is why they are including in the ETF in the first place. That's a great question, um, Marco. That's a great question. So I actually answered this question today. I did a workshop here in Sydney. And the reality is, Marco, that most ETFs trade much less frequently than actively managed funds or individual investors. So let's take, a, let's take the Vanguard VAS ETF, the biggest ETF in Australia. That's got the 300 largest shares inside of it. Now, the turnover of that ETF is only around 2% or so. So it's not really that high. That means that of all the stocks inside that ETF, they're only changing 2% of them every year. Now, let's compare that to an actively managed fund. Inside of an active fund manager, typically what you'll see is a holding period. So the average holding period of a stock anywhere between, say, six and eight months. Now, some studies show that the average fund manager holds stocks for around about six months. And so if you think about the turnover or the buying and selling that goes on inside one of these funds, you know, a lot of what happens is actually caused by active fund managers, um, not necessarily by the ETFs. And so I think the answer is no. I don't think there's a huge problem. And I think what we'll see is ETFs get bigger and they start to do more of the trading in the stock market. I think what we'll start to see is we'll start to see the transactions being netted off. So what I mean by that is, let's say you're the investor here and I'm you're the buyer and I'm the seller. If you click buy, typically what happens is your order is not, ma is not matched to me. It's typically matched to something called a market maker. And in that case, what that is, that's a financial institution that basically fulfills your trade, right? It's Think of it just like the ETF provider. But what we'll see as ETFs get bigger, we'll start to see the baby boomer generation and many of the other investors who have used ETFs for a long time start to slowly sell. So when you place a trade to buy an ETF, it will be matched by a seller. Now, that's really important to understand because what will then happen is if your buy and my sell decision are matched, what happens is there's no need for any trading underneath the surface because your investment basically becomes my investment. And there's no need for the ETF provider to go and buy and sell all the individual shares inside. So it's actually less trading. So I think what we'll see is probably some of that happen over time. So rather than say um, a lot of people are calling for an ETF bubble, I don't think that's the case. And I think we've got a long time to go. And I've been talking to a lot of um, individual uh, ETF providers about this lately. Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of the good news. Now, Let's get back to the task at hand because I've kind of babbled on for a little while. Um, so the, this fund has a management fee of 0.99%, and that should say per annum because it's every year. So that would be taken out automatically by the fund manager, in this case, Fidelity. Uh, it's got $210 million inside the, the fund that's on the, that's in, on the exchange. So there would be more money inside the underlying fund. So I think that was kind of what was being alluded to before. Um, so uh, the, f the next thing down is that um, the inception, so the performance since inception has been quite strong at 9.8%. So overall, it's a pretty high fee of 0.99% in the modern era for a, something that's like looks like an ETF and quacks like an ETF, but it's not quite an ETF. It's a pretty high fee, but you have to pay for the fund managers. So that's probably fair. 
Um, it's got a good amount of money inside it. Uh, and the inception, yeah, that's the thing, Harry. So the reason they don't put the the performance since 2013 is because they're doing the ETF, the, sorry, the listed fund performance, not the um, the actual managed fund. I hope that makes sense. So I quite like the the Femex uh, ETF or fund. I could keep calling it an ETF because I'm about to talk about one of those. But what I want you to keep in mind is typically when – oh, and good question here, Paul. This is going to hit my point. So considering, you say, Paul, that it's a managed fund, is that management fee above average for the industry? So um, not necessarily. So the average fee for an ETF, so not a fund but an ETF, is 0.48%. 0.48. So this is effectively double that, but you're not getting an ETF, you're getting an actively managed fund. Now, if you look at fund managers, so active funds in isolation, you're looking up more about 1%. If you're looking at listed investment companies, so they charge fees too. A lot of people think that they magically just do the thing without them noticing, but they charge fees. And those fees are about 0.8, I think it's about 0.87% on average. Now, these are just averages. Some of them are 2%, right, which is very, very high. So, um, Hari Haran, you've asked the question of what fee uh, would you consider is high? I, I would, I'm would, i struggling. So, I, I'm struggling for this fee right here. Let me explain why in a second. In Australia, I believe that you can now build a core portfolio like this right here. I believe that you can build a core portfolio and if you averaged out all of the fees inside your portfolio for around about 0.25%. So if you have some Australian shares, some in international shares, um, some bonds, some emerging markets, I think you can make that portfolio for 0.25%. If you go back to last week's show where we talked about building a core portfolio, uh, in that show from Rask Live last week, if you haven't already checked it out, it's available on YouTube. Go back and have a look at it. Um, that would be one of the most amazing shows that you'll watch, um, even though I'm saying that about the show that I was part of. But seriously, it adds so much value to long-term investors. Um, in that, I basically show you a core portfolio. So I show you exactly what would go into this type of thing. And in that, um, that portfolio that I've estimated in there, I think the fees for that entire core portfolio are 0.25%. Um, so that's something um, to keep in mind. So basically the way I treat this, to answer this question, um, uh, Vishal Gupta, there is no copy of this presentation, but um, I'm sure we could do something or you can just take a few screenshots if you want to. Um, but... Um, the, the basically the way that I treat this is that I give myself a budget. So I look at my portfolio overall and I say to myself, what is my budget for this portfolio? So how much will I be willing to accept in fees? Um, and for me, I don't really want my core portfolio to cost more than 0 0.5, maybe a bit more. Like if you think about just the portfolio itself, I don't think you need to, but then around the outside, uh, you could have a bit more. So you could have um, things that are higher fees. So how do I think about this? Let's get cut to the chase. So if Paul, you're saying Femex would be something to consider for a satellite portfolio then? This is the question that we're asking. While the fee is high, I think I'd be willing to put this fund in my uh, core portfolio. Now, this is a work in progress. My analyst team are currently working on this fund. So they're currently working on whether or not this is a good investment. So I don't have a definitive answer. If I could say to y'all, I could say, hey, can I come back and talk to you in two weeks time? I think that would be the update. So ask me in, on Rask Live in two weeks and I'll give you a proper answer. Um, but I would say at this time, I'd be willing to make it part of my core, but I want it to be a small part of the core. I don't think that this should be a large part. I'm saying like definitely less than 5% for this one fund in particular. Um, maybe a little bit more if you really wanted to push it. But I think for the most part, um, it can be in the core. For some people, it would be a satellite position. It's obviously not risk-free. So you should definitely seek the advice of a financial planner and read uh, read the PDS if you want to know more. So I'm going to label this a core position even though the fee is a little bit high, 
I'd still like it in my core portfolio because I think emerging markets long term uh, hold potential. I want to quickly clarify something though. Um, I had some notes. Is it this one? Um, I had some notes here. This is from Mal. Um, and I'm just going to go up to show you something. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, so oftentimes when you see a lot of people talk about emerging markets in China and India and these types of things, I want to sh tell you something that I think you should remember. So like you see some data that will say like, you know, in the years ahead, emerging markets, China, uh, India, these are the engine rooms of the global economy. All of the growth is going to come from Asia. I want to be very, very clear with you. Just because the economies are growing does not make the stock markets a good investment. So for all of my career, people have been saying China has, is, is the next big thing. India is the next big thing. But then you look at it and you go, well, um, let's take IEM. And you go, okay, so emerging markets are the next big thing. Okay, so, so far, so good. Let's put that right beside the US stock market. Let's compare that to the US stock market and let's go over five years. It's chalk and cheese. The US stock market has vastly outperformed the emerging markets. Let's see, if we've got some data going further back. So this is right back to 2008. It's not even close. The so-called emerging markets that are growing fast, not even close to the United States, even the Australian markets, to be honest. So the, the idea that, yeah, these countries are growing really fast, that's fantastic, but that does not necessarily mean that stock market investors get a good return. I want to be very clear about that. And there are many reasons, but one of the reasons might be that um, a lot of those countries don't have fully formed stock markets. So there's a lot of government intervention. They don't have their own bond, like thriving bond markets. They don't have good sources of capital. They don't have a lot of outside investment. Um, they don't, oftentimes they're not truly capitalistic, um, these types of things. So um, you don't, the stock market investors don't always get, um, Get the right returns. G'day, Benny. Good to see you, mate. Good to see you on the live stream, mate. Great to see you, in fact. Um, so uh, all I would say to you is don't think that like the emerging markets, China, India, are the promised land. And don't put it, eh. be very mindful about putting a big part of portfolios in there. Of course, I'm just speaking generally here. I can't give you personal advice. See a financial planner for that. But at the end of the day, I just think uh, for the most part, people get that wrong. And I just wanted to clarify. Okay, let's move on to Dr. Evil. So uh, maybe just as a comment in the chat, can you please tell me out of 10, how would you rate the coffee at Starbucks? Out of 10, 10 being, my golly, I love Starbucks coffee. Zero being, it's disgusting, I'd never eat, never drink it. What would you rate it out of 10? Please tell me while we look at this lovely photo of Dr. Evil from Austin Powers, which... Even if you don't like the coffee, you should probably check out Austin Powers. It's a hilarious show. Uh, Mike Myers is absolutely brilliant. So Harry's given a two, Raymond a zero, Anthony a two, Wendy a one. Oh, geez, everyone's... Okay, the highest score so far is Ron's given it a seven. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Mark an eight. Um, so <laughs> uh, Mariella's given it about 20 zeros. Um, Karen said never tried it. Um, Harry, two, because it's overpriced and not good compared to the Melbourne Standard Coffee. Susie over on um, over on uh, Facebook has given it a one. Uh, Matt's a two, so zero. Overrated, said Chris. I would say as a snobby Melbourneite that I am, and even here in Sydney or anywhere, to be honest, as all of Australia has absolutely wonderful coffee, I would say Starbucks is horrendous. So I would give it like a two. Um, but this is the thing, right? I wanted to... Um, talk to you about this because again we can sometimes get a little bit confused by what actually is investing and now if we look at this we would say but it's coffee's horrible why 
why would anyone go there, right? And a lot of the things that aren't really good do pretty well as investments. Um, and there are plenty of instances where you can draw this conclusion. Like at the end of the day, a lot of the things that people buy aren't good for them. Like a lot of the things that people spend a lot of money on, like fast cars and fashion bags and things like this, they turn out to be the best investments and they make no sense to a lot of people. Um, and so at the end of the day, if you are to be a successful investor, I believe you kind of have to put those biases aside of what do I like? What's my preference? And understand the market. So um, we can see Starbucks is listed uh, on the NASDAQ stock exchange. So S bucks is the ticker symbol, which is kind of a cool uh, ticker symbol. I was telling the guys today, it's kind of like if someone was trying to spruik a cryptocurrency, they would say they're Starbucks and it's like a cryptocurrency and you can buy it through some digital wallet that no one's ever heard of, or you can just use it at, um, literally at Starbucks itself. Um, but we're not here to talk about crypto, are we? So um, <laughs> Starbucks is famous for many reasons. Um, you may have seen it in the Austin Powers movies because it was also the, the headquarters of Dr. Evil, who was the evil villain, of course. Um, interestingly enough, Starbucks has thrived since it was, it wasn't founded by a guy called Howard Schultz, but uh, it's a business that has thrived with him being there. Then when he left and came back, it did well and he's left again. Um, the business overall has thrived because of this very simple idea. Under Howard Schultz, he had this view that he always asked people, and this is the narrative that he used, he said, what's your third place? So what he meant by what's your third place is he meant where is the third place that you go where you feel comfortable? So the first place would be your home. I hope you feel comfortable in your home. The second place would probably be work, the office. Most people go to work they, where they spend a lot of their waking hours. But what's your third place? And for a lot of people, that's the local coffee shop. And so Starbucks basically became, became this place where people would meet. You get free Wi-Fi. There's a little bit of music. Uh, you can go in there. And it's kind of like a bit of an atmosphere where you can spend some time. And so this is where the idea of Starbucks basically came from, was this idea that what's your third place? And it proliferated these coffee houses across America. Um, and so now it's grown throughout the world and it's probably a tale of two markets. You've got the mature American market and then you've got the Chinese market, which is definitely Starbucks growth engine. Um, and so you might remember, uh, Martin, you've said it's home coffee shop and then the wine bar. Um, so, <laughs> um, uh, so, Paul, you've said Starbucks worked out the average person will only walk 500 meters for a coffee, which is why the shops are everywhere. That's wonderful. I did not know that stat, Paul. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Starbucks is not about the coffee. It's it's all about the other drinks that they make, Stuart. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree. Uh, it's about the user experience, said Chris. Uh, and you can actually look at these, these numbers. So here we've got uh, in oh, just a quick one. For anyone that might be new to US investing, so you know how we call them annual reports in Australia? In the United States, they don't always call them annual reports. They're called 10Ks. So 10K is like their, I guess, their taxonomy or their way of saying this is what this document is. So a 10K is a version of their annual report and it's better than our annual reports. But here we can see the number of stores that they have. You can see where they are. So they've got 5,000 stores in China. Um, out of a total of 17,000. Um, they've got the UK and they've got Japan as another massive market. You can see how many were opened and closed, et cetera. You can see they opened, this is last year's financial report, by the way. They opened 660 on a net basis in China. Huge numbers, absolutely massive. Um, and if we keep going down, now this is a point that, um, uh, who was saying this just a moment ago? Uh, Stuart. So here you can see uh, the, where they make their money. So this is all in the annual report yet again. And you can see that most of the money comes from beverages like coffee, those frappes that they make, the tea, all that sort of stuff. Then they make a little bit from food, but then they sell other stuff, you know, like whatever, you know, packaged goods. Um, they sell like those cups, the keep cups and that sort of stuff. A lot of people don't know this, but um, Starbucks actually makes 
uh, quite a bit of money from other things, which I'll bring it up. I'll see if I've got it here. Actually, I've got it on my next slide. So Starbucks makes a bit of money because it actually operates under different brands. So they they have different partnerships, like with Nest, part of me, Nestle and these types of things. And so they supply a lot of stores too. And um, it's a business that, uh, remember a few weeks ago how I said that one of the reasons that the US stock market has done so well is, um, so if we bring up, say this, remember a few weeks ago, I said that if you invest in the US stock market, you're not just getting US companies that operate in the US. You know, I'm recording this here on an Apple device, a US company, but I'm in Australia. You're probably watching this on a Microsoft device or an Apple device. You're probably watching it through a Google browser on YouTube, Alphabet. US company. And so Starbucks is one of these companies that is on the United States Stock Exchange, but actually earns a substantial amount of money from Asia. And I actually think that this would be a better way for more investors to get exposure to places like China and uh, India and these types of places. You don't have to invest directly in those countries or in an ETF that targets those shares directly. You can invest in developed countries markets and get the exposure that way. So I think you guys know this, but the, the, the rough figure is around 25 to 30% of all money made by America's top companies comes from outside of America. So you're getting some global diversification anyway. Um, and that's why I think that's a, a, a good bet. Um, so that that's that's the one. Uh, Ron, you've just made a comment. I, I do like this one. I appreciate it. The US reports are difficult and take a lot of time to analyze. You know what, Ron? I might quickly disagree with you there because I actually think they're much easier. And I'll give you an example, right? So let's say you go into an annual report from the United States. You say, wow, it's 144 pages. Here's a tip. Do not read 144 pages. You only need to read about the first 25 so one of the things that the U.S. Um, companies have to do is if you click on business or risk factors here, they have to tell you the risks. In Australia, when you click on an annual report, it goes straight to the revenue and profit and some, you know, chairman letter and the CEO's address. And it's just nonsense. Honestly, it's like a lot of fluff and, oh, here's how wonderful we are. Look how great we are. We did this. Wonderful. Hooray. In the U.S., they can't do that. They have to go straight to the risks and tell you about the business, who they compete against, where they operate. And it's a very factual first 20 pages. So I love it. Um, but then the other thing that you obviously want to look at is duh, 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 duh. you can look at this section here, item seven, the, like the management's commentary, if you want that. But it's actually this one here, item eight, that I spend most of my time looking at. So if we click on this, we go down. This is all the financial statements. Uh, and it's really easy to see how things come together. So I actually prefer it, but I'm glad that you commented that, Ron. So thank you. Okay. So where would this go in a portfolio? There is something I don't have time to get to you, get across to you. But one of the things that you can quickly pick up on, if you go Starbucks and you use any type of data um, thing, like say here we've got uh, self wealth. But if we go to the balance sheet, I want to show you something that's happening behind the scenes. So people might not know this. But behind the scenes, we can see Starbucks is bringing on more debt. So it's using debt and it's using that debt to buy back a lot of shares. So what that does is that has the impact of reducing the number of shares while increasing the debt balance. And it pushes up the share price. But that can't go on forever. Now, it's not a serious, dangerous risk factor, but it's something that you should be aware of before you become a long-term investor in a company is how much debt does it have and what is the direction that that amount of debt is going. And for me, um, it's just something that I'm mindful of. It's not something that I'm scared of, but it's something that I'm very mindful of. So you can see it here in total long-term debt. So they've got a bit of debt and by contrast, they don't have that much cash. Not always the best thing for me. So I tend to um, just keep that as an idea in the back of my mind. But I'm going to say that I would, if I was going to put it anywhere, I would put it in my satellite, um, but it would only be a very, very small position. And I'm saying very, very small, like definitely under 1%. And it'd be more just to see how it goes over time and build my conviction through time. 
All right, let's move on because I'm taking way too long for this. Um, so the next thing is uh, beta shares, and I'll be quick here because we talked about emerging markets a lot. So this ETF effectively just takes your money and invests it in technology companies from uh, Asia. And you can see some of the companies over here, Samsung, Taiwan Semiconductor, the world's largest uh, chip manufacturer. Um, you can see Alibaba, Tencent, uh, Infosys, uh, JD.com, et cetera. The list goes on. Alibaba's in there too. Remember that you can invest in Alibaba via, sorry, via US markets. You don't have to do it directly through China. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, we can see the fee is 0.67%. So to answer people's questions about fees, basically anything over um, 50, 0.15, 0.5, sorry, 50 basis points, 0.5%. Anything over that, I immediately think this could, is probably going to be in my satellite. Now, so let's just repeat that. Anything over 0.5% for an ETF, I think satellite first. Now, obviously, you can consider putting that in the core like I did before with Femex, but I would say that's where it goes first. Let's have a look at some other stuff. There's 460, uh, $470 million invested inside the ETF. It's a lot of uh, money inside the ETF. Um, the returns over the past three years are actually negative, 0.5%. And the reason is that the Chinese government and the Communist Party in China uh, has been very heavy-handed with some of the technology companies, uh, in particular the likes of Alibaba. Uh, these types of businesses have um, experienced quite a bit of uh, what we would call a drawdown, so there's been a lot of uncertainty around those, as well as like, um, I guess, just the general flow of COVID over the last few years. Like China's been very heavily impacted by COVID recently, and that has impacted its businesses. So this hasn't been a great three years for the fund, but that could be turning around because if we look at it, uh, is this the one? Yep. So if we look at it over the past year, it seems to have turned around a little bit. Uh, with performance starting to come back over the past year, 8%, it's up. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, when you go to the beta shares or any of the ETF providers' website, uh, you can go and you can click on the fact sheet just here, as well as all the PDS, which I'd highly encourage everyone to read. Um, you can go and click on the PDS as the fact sheet, and inside the fact sheet, you get this. Now, I want to show you something in particular here. So inside the PDS, uh, you will see down the right-hand side here, there is the price earnings ratio. So here we can see the price earnings ratio of the, the average of what's inside the fund is 16. So a PE ratio of 16. So that just compares the prof, the price of the shares to the profits that they make. It's 16 times. Lower is cheaper. Now, if we look at the most popular, one of the most popular, I think it is the most popular beta shares ETFs, the NASDAQ ETF. So this is the United States version. Um, it is on a price earnings ratio of 24.6. So what this tells you is the US stock market for technology companies is much more expensive than the Asian ones. And that's because you basically get a better uh, set of technology companies, those global technology companies, truly global technology companies. So that's why you pay more for them. But the long-term average for the US market is still pretty high. So it's not necessarily saying it's overvalued. It's just that relative to the Asian technology companies, they're much more expensive. Um, so you, you could be saying, well, the performance hasn't been that good, but they look cheaper. So maybe that's a good reason. I would say yes, but at the same time with a high fee, um, still proving its track record, I would say right now, I'm probably not that interested in investing in the Asia ETF. Um, to be honest, it's probably closer to an avoid. But if I'm being generous, it's very small allocation in the satellite. So in the satellite allocation um, is where I'd be looking to put it rather than uh, in the core. It wouldn't be a core position for me. So it would be um, halfway between avoid and satellite. If I'm being br like brutally honest, it's probably an avoid for now and then a revisit next year. So uh, that would be one. Now, this second last company, I won't spend too much time on here because I know people have already commented about ANZ, which was last on my list. So BYD is a, um, well, it's basically an automotive business these days, but it wasn't always an automotive business. So it's probably the number one competitor in electric vehicles to Tesla. So if you're familiar with Tesla and the electric vehicles, uh, BYD, beyond your dreams, is probably the number one um, competitor. It's the biggest manufacturer in China uh, and it's 
basically dominating the Chinese market, but Tesla is trying to make inroads, no pun intended, into the Chinese market. So um, you can see here in the financials, and this is just taken from self wealth, you can see here what looks like a hockey stick, kind of like it's like bending up, or if you were looking at down it, it would be like kind of like as a hockey stick bends down. Um, and you can see here that it's hit what we call an inflection point. So in financial lingo, basically that just means that it's starting to grow faster than ever before. And you can see that um, it started to hit that and profitability has kicked into not nearly to the extent of say Tesla, um, but still uh, very, very impressive. Uh, if I bring this up, I'll just show you Tesla's equivalent. So if we go, uh, get rid of that. Come on, go away. There we go. And if we go here and we go total revenue and we go net profit or net income, and we can see Tesla is kicking off in a much bigger way uh, in US dollars there, of course. Uh, and so both companies are experiencing what we call inflection point or scalability. Um, obviously, in terms of quality, Tesla's probably a higher quality company. You probably have the more of the regulation of the US uh, ecosystem. But let's just bring up BYD's financials again. And if we go here and we go to... Uh, some of the ratios, perhaps. Let's have a look at some of these, like we did um, last year on Self Off Live. And we can see things like profit margins, and we can see pretty slim profit margins compared to, say, Tesla's, which are much higher. Uh, we can see net profit margins still pretty low, but still positive, which is good. Um, so, not nearly as high a quality, but still growing fast. Uh, if we come down to one of my favorite metrics, you will know is the return on investment is 7.16%. So, that basically shows you how profitable the business is internally when it invests in itself. Now, if we take the same um, thing for Tesla, let's have a look. I don't know what this is going to come up with, so it could be uh, throwing it back in my face. But if we go down to this and we look at return on investment, so it's 11%. So it's meaningfully better. Uh, we can see uh, duh, 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 gross margins in the double digit 20% range. So again, much higher quality. Um, that doesn't mean that Tesla will win. But if I had the choice, I would probably take Tesla over BYD uh, as an individual share to own. Um, but that said, I want to just quickly double click on something before we get to ANZ, which is that when you're investing in fast growth industries, one of the mistakes you can make is you can try and bet everything on one winner, a certain future, which is very, very difficult to do. So one of the things that individual investors can do, which all of us could probably do, is we can afford to take a bit more of a basket approach. So these would only be ever, in my, my opinion, these are the types of positions that would be in the satellite because they're much, much more volatile. Um, I wouldn't put one of these individual shares in my core por portfolio unless I was really confident in that. Um, and even then I would check myself at the door, to be honest. Um, but in any case, what you can do is you can take a portfolio approach. So let's say instead of having, oh, I'm in love with Tesla, it is the future of everything. Um, maybe instead of say, $5,000 in Tesla and nothing in anything else. You could do $3,000 in Tesla, $1,000 in BYD, and $1,000 or $500 by two in something else. And that way you spread your eggs and you don't go all in. And then if it turns out you're right and Tesla is the winner, well, at least you got some investment in it. And then you can sell the other things in time and put it all into Tesla. Or if it turns out you're wrong, at least then you've got exposure to other investments in that industry. And I think that's a much more reasonable way to go about high growth investing that a lot of investors don't do. Um, so, um, okay, let's go on to the last thing. So you're probably thinking, well, hey, Owen, how does ANZ, how does ANZ get into a discussion about uh, core satellite avoid? Oh, I've actually got to put a thing on this. So I would actually say satellite, very small. Um, that's what I would say for that. Um, so how does ANZ fit in amongst all these other things that look like emerging markets and Asia and these types of things? Well, ANZ obviously stands for Australia and New Zealand Banking Group, but a big part of Asia, ANZ's strategy for the past 15 years and why it's been pretty horrible, to be honest, is because it's spent a lot of time focusing on something that it calls, quote, unquote, super regional strategy. So the ANZ super regional strategy, um, if we go to it like this, it's basically resulted in the company not performing nearly as well as it should have. Um, so let me just show you what that looks like against the, the big competitor, which is CBA here in Australia. 
TBA didn't do the uh, super regional strategy and ANZ did. And you can see how that basically resulted in the fortunes going towards Commonwealth Bank. Um, so while ANZ has still been a really good investment for investors who have reinvested their dividends, uh, for the most part, they've lost out on a lot of gains when they could have had that, If, the, in my opinion, if the bank just focused on Australia. Um, and I'll show you how that is illustrated in the company's financials. So if we go back to my uh, sheets here, you will see that um, this chart here basically plots in the blue line, it plots the income that it makes from lending and the red line plots what it makes from other stuff. So this would be like um, banking overseas that's not to do with lending, like investment banking, um, any types of like insurance, um, wealth management overseas or in Australia, these types of things, financial planning in times gone by. You can see where those other fees kind of crept into the pie and you see that they're not nearly as lucrative. So the number one thing that ANZ should be doing is lending money. And instead, like all the banks, it basically got swept up in something else and it lost focus. Now, if it paid off and their super regional strategy paid off, it would have been a wonderful thing. But for the most part, um, ANZ shareholders were kind of, kind of lost out because the business tried to expand overseas. Now, you could say, well, ANZ sold some of those businesses and gave you know, that profit back in the form of dividends and these types of things. Yeah, maybe. But I just think that particularly in New Zealand, like ANZ is the dominant bank. And uh, in Australia too, it's a dominant bank. It's not the dominant bank, but it's a dominant bank. And it could have really done so much better than it could have, like it, it did, if it just focused on a really conservative Australia first strategy. Um, and while I, let's, let's, let's just be a bit, a little bit um, less brutally honest. Um, right now, the shares are currently yielding a trailing, that's last year's, trailing dividend yield of 6% and a price earnings ratio of 11 times. So it's pretty cheap. Um, let's say hypothetically that the dividend yield could be maintained at 6%. So all else being equal, the dividend continues to be paid. Let's assume that. Nothing else changes. Well, you're getting a 6% return plus franking credits if you're eligible for franking credits, which most long-term Australian tax residents uh, look. Long-term investors who are Australian tax residents should be entitled to dividends that are fully franked. So you're probably getting closer to a 9% return when you include franking credits. And so that's a pretty good return for owning something that's pretty stable for the most part. Um, so let's have a look. You say, um, Martin, let's chuck, uh, instead of uh, Commonwealth Bank, let's chuck Solpats there. The mighty soul parts. Let's chuck that in there and compare that to ANZ. And there we go. So you could have, <laughs> you could have uh, put the money in soul parts. Now, hindsight is a wonderful thing. Who would have known that soul parts would grow from a pretty small company at the time, admittedly, into something like this? Uh, and let's, uh, Paul, you've said, um, forget my question. You said they're miles apart in terms of performance between Bendigo Bank. But let's just chuck Bendigo Bank. Bendigo Bank is a much smaller bank. Um, because it's more what we call a regional bank. And so we can see here over time, it's not really close. So Bendigo Bank has struggled because one of the benefits that the big banks have, ANZ, NAB, Westpac, Commonwealth Bank and Macquarie, one of the, the benefits that they have is they have a different risk, um, a different risk management framework. So there's been a special basically rule granted to these five companies that effectively allow the biggest banks in Australia to set the risk of their lending in their own way, like within rules, versus the little banks which have to contend with different sets of rules. And so what that means is they can have better lending rates and they can be more competitive on international markets and these types of things. So there is a competitive advantage around these businesses. Let's have a quick look at what analysts have to say about ANZ going forward. So if we go to ANZ and we go to the forecasts. Remember to keep in mind that I don't trust analyst forecasts. They're just a guide to what other people are thinking. Uh, and we can see the dividends forecast for the future are a little bit higher than today's dividend, right? So they think that it might go up a little bit, um, which is really interesting. But I want to add one caveat here is this. 
when you have the profits of a bank, also the, the income that a bank receives from lending or from other fees that they charge, if the bank is at risk of people defaulting like on their mortgages or small business loans, what happens is those defaults are instantly applied against the profitability. So you can see that on the income statement. So what that means is if the bank think there's going to be more people defaulting on mortgages, which might be a thing, um, effectively the, the profitability is wiped out. And that means if the profitability is wiped out, the dividend can be cut as well. So don't think that it's like a guaranteed income stream. So for that reason, um, I want to just propose something else to you. So say, for example, we're making a decision between a good dividend stock like ANZ and say, for example, uh, an ETF. You can spread your risk rather than investing in one individual share, you can spread your risk to an ETF that spreads the you know, the, the portfolio across many different companies, not just one or two. So the, probably the best example of that would be, and many of you will know this, I'm going to say it. If you're going to consider investing in a big bank for dividend yield, go and consider an ETF like this as well beside it. So here we go. If we go down to the yield, da, 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 da. and of course it's not here. Let's go to the fact sheet, um, which is, I cannot see that or portfolio data here we go so this here we can see if you invest in the vhy etf which is an etf from vanguard you get 70 you get exposure to 76 different companies that pay dividends um, they're quite large companies but the estimated this is just the estimated dividend yield is 5.78 percent and the price earnings ratio is 12 or 13 so yes, it's a little bit more expensive. And yes, the dividend yield isn't quite as high. But at the same time, your risk is spread across 70 different companies rather than trying to pick the one winning bank. Um, so I would just say at any one time you think of making an investment, there are only two reasons that most people would buy something. That's for the growth or the income. If you're going into a growth investment, think to yourself, is there a better way to get this growth? you know, through an ETF or through whatever, is there a better way to get this income? And I think for the last five to 10 years in my career, I've been telling people that I'd probably buy an ETF over a blue chip stock for income because it might you might get less income in the short term, but over the long term, it's more resilient because you've got your risk spread across more individual holdings. Now, one of the benefits of Washington H. Sol Pattinson or Sol Pats, which you sure we've, we've spoken about on the show before, um, is that with Sol Pats, you actually end up, it is diversified because it goes and buys other companies. So it's not just, even though it's one share price, you actually do get exposure to a few other things. Uh, Will and Gabba, good to see you back, mate. So you've said, I've read lately that there's been a few downgrades on some of the banks due to bad and doubtful debts. And that's the thing to keep in mind. So is as those debts, potentially those bad debts rise, there's a risk that the bad debts from the bank start to outweigh the profits and the dividends aren't as crisp. Like, for example, in the COVID crash, we saw some of that. Those banks cut dividends. Um, as well as some other companies, frankly. But um, that's the real risk, is you go into one of these bank stocks thinking, well, happy days, I'll invest in it, I'll get a dividend, but the dividend's cut. So keep that um, in mind. Uh, Robert, you've asked a question. Owen, would you consider VHY, the Vanguard ETF, uh, as part of your core portfolio for planning for retirement years? Yes, is the answer I would, Robert. I can't give you personal advice. This is just generally for like a port someone's portfolio in retirement. Um I would say that, yes, some financial advisors use it. Um, so speak to a financial advisor to see their opinion if you do see one. Um, I would consider it, but here's the thing. I wouldn't consider a total replacement for uh, the portfolio because the dividend ETFs aren't perfect. Um, they're good to tilt a portfolio towards more income, and they're definitely better than picking individual stocks for income, in my opinion. But at the same time, um, they can be used for strategically balancing a portfolio towards more income. So um, 
So uh, chart over my desk list. When this, uh, David, you've said, when the fixed loan expiry peak hits for four banks, September 23, um, 25% in December, uh, sorry, in March, and you go on to say, yeah, so a lot of the fixed rates that we see from the banks will be rolling off soon. And I think that the RBA's decision to not increase interest rates isn't a reflection of that, that they know that people are rolling off their fixed rate mortgages and onto variable rates, and a lot of them won't be able to afford that. Martin, you've said VAS, which is the Vanguard Australian Shares ETF versus VHY. I think the VAS ETF should make up a bigger part of my core portfolio. Um, and that's what we're doing at RASC when we're building these new portfolios is um, we're putting more fraud-based ETFs like VAS alongside um, any type of income-producing thing. Um, oh, yeah, this is a good one, Mullen Gabba. Thank you for bringing this up. Uh, Bank of Queensland report their results in a week, so maybe a good guide to the degree of risk in the other banks. That's a great point. Good one. Um, so finally, we'll end with a quote. Um, oh, and where would I put ANZ? I've got it on my... To be honest, I've got it on my avoid list. It's not because I think it's a bad bank. And I'm, it's not because I think that um, you should sell it. Like I'm not telling anyone to buy, hold, sell. Maybe that's the whole point of this. Um, but I would just say that I don't need to own it right now. And I'd rather wait for a few months to see what plays out before I consider it to be truly cheap. Um, so we've got ANZ avoid, very small position for BYD alongside some other tech innovators. I'd avoid the Asia ETF for now. Starbucks I could put in my core portfolio. Uh, sorry, not my core, in my satellite, but it would be very, very small. And the reason why it would be in my satellite is because every time I go past a Starbucks and I see a bunch of people in there buying a horrible coffee, I would think to myself, you know what? I'm glad people don't like good coffee because at least I'm benefiting in some way. And I would consider Femex, the Fidelity Emerging Markets Fund, as part of my core, but probably as a small part, maybe even in the satellite for most people. Um, but I wouldn't go too heavy into that. So my final quote for tonight is, know what you own and why you own it. From Peter Lynch, you've probably seen, the, seen it before. The book, One Up on Wall Street, is a fantastic book for learning about investing. Investing primarily in individual companies is what Peter Lynch is known for. Um, great fund manager of his time. Okay, so... Tell me, guys, what do you think of the core satellite avoid segments on Rask Live? Do you enjoy them? Let me know in the comments because uh, we'll do it again next month and I'll have some guests with me. But also, hey, throw your ideas into the chat. Please throw them in now. ETFs, stocks, funds, throw them in. Uh, uh, I was about to say Monique. No, Monique and I, Melissa and I will review them uh, and we'll come up with five more ideas for next month, uh, which is great. Danica, thank you for that. Um, great quote, says Karen Ely from Women Talking Finance. Karen, thank you. It was a, it was Mel's choice of quote tonight, and uh, I'm glad she chose that one because I did give away some of those books today and indeed last night at our event, and I was very, very happy with that. Okay, so ETFs, says Colin Moore. ETFs, th thematics like hack, says Robert. Uh, Chandra Khan, you've said 10-year bond has now gone up to 4.8%. Ooh, it is indeed at 4.8%. And what that means is that I think if interest rates slow down globally, bonds are back. Uh, to put it, as it was said to me recently with the beta shares team, bonds are back, baby. And I think that's um, a start to, I think now is the time to start considering bonds in a portfolio. I think it's great. Uh, Colin, you've got AAA, AAA is the ETF. Um, Hari Haran, you've said, advice which ETF index funds or shares to invest in. So we can't give advice on which ones to invest in right now for any one individual, Hari Haran. But what we can do is uh, we can do course at a lot of void next month. So be sure to subscribe and we'll be back. We're back every week, every Wednesday. Um, Mike, you've said, HZN Horizon Oil paying a huge dividend. We can chuck that on the list too. Uh, JV, definitely for the core satellite avoid is really informative. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Francis, you've said, are bonds the reason why the market is so down today? Yeah, so basically it's interest rates in the economy is my crystal ball gazing uh, explanation. So that would be what I say. Um, so uh, thanks, dudes. <laughs> Another good one, says Benny. Thanks, mate. Uh, David, so considering an ETF due to getting ridiculously hard to pick winners and small caps. David, hold that thought. Um, you know what? I agree with you. ETFs are wonderful. But also, I think small caps are wonderful too. So, um, and 
you know, we don't know. We, the hit, past is only a, a very rough guide to the future. We don't know for sure. But I still think there are many small cap companies in Australia that while they are in the doldrums now, their futures are looking bright. So that's one. BGBL says, Neil, that's a good one. I like it. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Morkwright, you've said um, quite the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be back next week. Don't forget to check out the back catalogue of Rask Live. Maybe some consumer staples companies. Yeah, I'd love to do that. I'd love to do like a like a Home Depot again or a Woolworths or a Walmart or a Costco or a, even like a JB Hi-Fi, which is more retail focused, not really staples, discretionary maybe. Love to do them. So chuck them in the chat. If you're watching this back on replay, as I know a few thousand people tend to do, chuck that in the comments below the video and let us know what you think. We'll be back next week, probably the same time actually, but I'll be recording from Bali, uh, maybe a bit warmer there. So I'll see you then. Thank you, everyone, who tuned in tonight. Thank you, Karen. Special shout out to you for tuning in tonight. I really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone. Um, I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful week. Stock markets are volatile in the short term. Don't worry about that. But over the long term, they've proven to be um, a great place to invest. So thanks. Bye for now. See you next time.